Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come with me to Luke 17 in your Bible. Praise your Lord. Hallelujah. Verse, verse 11. I'm going to start out. It says, And it came to pass that Jesus, or he went to Jerusalem, and he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. That, that is along the middle or in between the two of them. And he entered into a certain village, and there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood uh, far off. And they lifted up their voices and says, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he says, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them that saw that he was healed turned his back, or turned back, sorry, and with a loud voice glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet and gave thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? They are not found to return to give God the glory, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made you whole. Father, be glorified in your word. Be exalted. Lord, continue to touch lives. Do miracles, Lord, still. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus and for his glory. Hallelujah. 23 years I'm saved this year. And yet I will never forget the night that I got saved. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget walking into a prayer meeting in the White Well Tabernacle, broken, afraid, and filled with fear. Many emotions going through my mind, my heart. I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know really the love of God, salvation. All I knew was I needed to get saved. That's all I knew. I needed this man called Jesus in my life. I'd heard it for long enough through a man called Tommy Reed. And the incredible thing is, is when I walked in that night, with all that fear, with all that anxiety, all that came, it was that night I truly, truly encountered Jesus. Truly encountered him. That night when the Holy Spirit touched my life and Jesus had come in and lived inside of me, I remember the joy. I remember the sense of overwhelming joy that flooded my soul. Overwhelming joy of love that touched me and an enormous weight that lifted off my shoulders. It's incredible. I remember the weight lifting off me, and not only did I feel spiritually something had changed, but I felt physically lighter. Something in me rejoiced. There was a, 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 a step, a, a spring in my step, and all I wanted to do was celebrate. You, you've heard the story. I'm not going to tell you it again. Burger King. All I wanted to do was celebrate it. Because something happened, folks. And when a man or a woman truly meets Jesus, I mean truly meets Jesus, something incredible happens on the inside. It's, it's, it's more than words. It's, it's more than we can put into words. Something incredible. And I remember when John was, was, was standing in the foyer, I couldn't convey to him what I was really feeling. But all I could say was, so let's celebrate. Because there was this overspilling joy of something that happened. What happened? I met Jesus. I met Jesus. You know, the Bible is full of men and women that have met Jesus. It's full of men and women that have had an encounter with Jesus. And even in here tonight, this room is full of people that have met Jesus. 
and you've had an encounter with him and you've experienced what I've experienced. You've sensed that joy, that hope, that power, that, that life given source that comes from the Holy Ghost. We've experienced a hallelujah. But in Luke 17, there's a group of men and they, they, they probably more than likely live in a colony by themselves or, or with others, but a, a colony of lepers, a community of their own, uh, a, a people group of their own, separated from society, all because of a horrendous incurable disease that will one day eventually kill them. And Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, and as he goes there, he goes between Samaria and Galilee, and he's going to stop at a village along the way. Nothing is an accident with Jesus. Everything has a purpose. Everything he does has a purpose. And he goes to a city, and he's, and he's there, and all of a sudden, these men appear. But before we talk about these men, let's understand the context of it. In the community or in the Israelite community, when a person discovered a rash or a skin disorder, he was immediately to be examined by the priest for leprosy. And if it was determined that he had leprosy and therefore contagious, he was declared ceremonially unclean. Unclean. He was no longer to be a part of society or she. They were no longer allowed to be dwelling with others. They were no longer even allowed to dwell with their family. They had to become total outcasts, living isolated away from all contact of other human existence except other lepers. Life was miserable. Life was a death sentence. It was incurable uh, uh, by man mostly. And, and many believed that it was God-inflicted curse because of people's sins that they had committed. It was despised. That person would be despised and would be loathed and would not be allowed to live with the people other than lepers. Lepers lived in a community literally until either they got better or they died. That was the life of a leper. It was so contagious that they couldn't be risked within normal population. In Jewish law, there was 61 defilements for a person, and the most serious was to touch a dead body. Do you know what the second one was? To touch a leper. In other words, you were equated as a dead man. You may as well be dead. That is the, the parallel. Couldn't touch you, couldn't go near you, couldn't be around you, couldn't, couldn't sit with you. Could you imagine, folks? I, I, I tell you a funny story. When I, as you know, the COVID, it was a, a year later, maybe, what was it a year later, we met a wee woman member in Polly Clare. She came over to me. She was awestruck, starstruck almost. <laughs> Are you Pastor Lee McClellan? I am. I can't believe this. She, she was, she was, uh, and it was, it was one of those moments, I, I, I didn't know really what to say to her either. And she says, I can't believe I'd met you. I says, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> She said, and she went, she went, to, this is a year later, and she went to give me a hug or shake my hand, and then she paused and went, whoa, whoa, will I be okay if I touch you? <laughs> That's a year later, folks. Why am I saying that? Because, because this was the thought process of anybody that encountered a leper. I can't get near you. I can't go near. I don't, it doesn't matter how famous you are. 
It doesn't matter you're standing in a community. I can't go near you. This was the life of a leper. They would probably never truly be able to say goodbye to their family again. Properly. They would probably never be able to embrace a loved one again. They would be off outside of the city to an encampment or to a colony where they would wait and see their fate. There was no great hope in the scriptures for lepers. There was only two really that we know of that were ever hailed. One was Miriam and she got up because, because she was challenging her brother Moses. And then there was Naaman. And really outside of that, there's no great hope for a leper. There's, there's no great hope stories. There's no great message of hope. It was, it was, it, it was really a death sentence, folks. There, there, there was no hope outside of it. So they couldn't really turn to scriptures on a regular basis and say, here's my great hope. There wasn't any. And folks, oh, oh folks, hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. That's why so many people are ill. That's why so many people are stressed. That's why so many people have physical ailments because of the, of the lack of hope in their lives. There is none. They're looking for it. The other man was King Uzziah and he died. You see, the reason I'm saying that is this. When you got leprosy, there was no great hope stories, really. You, you were in trouble. And then we come into the Gospels. And the first man that we ever read of being healed of leprosy was in Matthew chapter 8. And not only did Jesus heal this man, but, but, but he touched him. And that was now breaking down the barriers. That was breaking down the chain. Jesus, Jesus all of a sudden touched the leper. The thing that you're not supposed to do. The thing that is, that is equated to a dead body. You're not supposed to go near it. You're not supposed to touch it. And here Jesus reaches out and touches him and heals him. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden there's a man on the scene who is willing to touch the leper. Wow. All of a sudden we have our story of hope. There's a man who's willing to touch me. Could you imagine the conversation? Did you know that Jesus touched a leper? They're joking, man. Seriously, I can see it. Folks, here's, here's the reality of it all. All of a sudden, we have a story of hope. That's why it's important for us to tell each other stories of hope. That's why it was important for you to hear tonight about Connie's young boy. Because there may be some of you sitting tonight asking the question, is there hope for me? Yeah. You see, for all of a sudden, I maybe only make a suggestion. I, I don't know. I can't know for sure. But is it possible? Is it possible that throughout the leper's community, they began to hear that there's a man that touches the leper. Is it possible that all of a sudden they begin to hear of a man called Jesus Christ who is willing to touch the leper? Is it possible? Hallelujah! Is it possible? Could you imagine for a moment... In their pain and anguish and agony, there's a moment of hope. And it may be little hope, but it's hope. And it may seem even far-reaching, but it's hope. And it may seem that it sounds too good to be true, but it's hope. Is that not what people need, folks? Hope. Is that not what you need? Is that not what I need? Hope. And so all of a sudden, maybe, maybe hope rises, but I want to bring something else. Because in their pain, they were unified, regardless of their religious or political identity. There is something incredible about the human pain. There's something incredible about human misery. It doesn't matter what side of the fence you come from. 
It doesn't matter what your political allegiance might be. It doesn't matter even what your thinking might be. Here's all that matters is in our misery, we are united. It often used to amaze me in the drugs world, particularly, how they were so easily able to go from one side of the community to the other, to the other. With a common unification, we are desperate for drugs. It didn't matter about any political divide. It didn't matter about any political argument. When, when the rattle hit in of a drug addict, all that mattered was, have you got drugs? Have you got drugs? It doesn't matter who's got the drugs. It doesn't matter where we have to go. In our misery and in our pain, we're unified. And that's where these lepers were. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or you're a Samaritan. It doesn't matter what you think or what you believe. Here we are. Look at us. Look at us. You've got blisters all over you. I've got blisters all over you. Your flesh is eating away. My flesh is eating away. We're miserable. And folks, that's the, that's the, human, the human life. When we find ourselves lying in a hospital bed and we're looking at the man across from us, it doesn't matter where you're from anymore. It doesn't matter. All that matters is this. We're going through absolute hell. Where's our hope? That's the anguish of the human life. That's the anguish of pain coming together. And isn't it strange how misery brings us all to a common place. Of here we are sitting together and we've all got our pains and our anguishes and our hurt. And yet all our heart's desire is is Jesus. Jesus. May we never lose the heart for him. May we never forget what he has done. But in that misery, they are united in hope. Incredible. There's one thing that all humanity does in a crisis, and that is hope. Hope for a better outcome. Hope for a change. Hope for life. Hope for freedom. Hope for healing. We all hope for something. We all long that when human tragedy strikes, we all hope that somehow things will work out. And yet for the first time, maybe in their ears, hope rises up because they maybe hear what Jesus has done. They maybe hear of his fame. They maybe hear of what he can do. And here's these men carrying disease maybe for weeks, maybe for months, maybe for years. We don't know. I suggest years, but I could be wrong. But here's, regardless what it is, here they are, all in the same common place, but all willing to risk coming out, as it were, of the colony, or risk coming out of the encampment. Why? Just in the hope of a miracle. You know what that tells me? Sometimes we have to take risks, even in our embarrassment, to come to meet Jesus. Sometimes all we want to do is hide. Hide in the house. Hide in our communities. Hide. Go nowhere. See no one. We're embarrassed. We're embarrassed of our circumstances. We're embarrassed of our lives. We're embarrassed of what has happened to us. And what does that end up doing? It ends up isolating us. It ends up me saying or someone saying, I'll stay in the house, I'll not go out. It ends up you cutting yourself off from friends, from family. And all of a sudden, folks, you're isolated. Sometimes you have to risk the embarrassment of coming out and coming forward and believing God to touch your life. Sometimes it's worth the risk coming up the front. Even when everybody's looking at God and and you're thinking... They know what's going on with me or, or I'm embarrassed about coming up or it doesn't matter. 
What matters more is who be God. It's all that matters. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks at that point. Listen, the lepers could have stayed in the colony, but law, listen, they, they took a risk. We're going to come out. We're going to come out of hiding. And so they come out. And they could have been chastised. They could have been shouted at. They could have been get told to get back. Get back into your colony. Get back into where you belong. You don't belong out here. But folks, such was their drive to see Jesus. You know, I love desperate people. Because desperate people usually mean business. They usually mean business. Flaky people don't mean business. When they come and sit with you or they spend time with you or want to talk about it, when they're flaky, I know straight away you, you don't mean business with God. But when somebody comes and they've no more excuses, they've no, they've no more arguments, they've no more, I want to fight with you, they just come and say, I am desperate. Oh, we can do business because we can get on our knees and we can begin to ask the God of heaven to touch our life. These men had now run out of all their excuses. They had nothing left in life. All they had is, we need to get to this man called Jesus. Is that you today? You need to get to Jesus. Not to me. To Jesus. And finally, they come to a place where hope is standing in front of them. Wow. Not only now have they heard about him, now they see him. There he is. They don't go close to him, but it says that the ten men that were lepers stood afar off, but they lifted their voices and says, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. What I read from this text is this. They were close enough to Jesus that they didn't need to shout. They didn't need to shout. They didn't shout, but they lifted their voices. It, the, the, the text reads that they just raised their voice enough that Jesus could hear them. So in other words, they really weren't that far away. They got as close as what they felt they could. And in getting that close, they were able to lift Jesus. Have mercy, have mercy on us. Well, sometimes we don't need to shout for Jesus to hear about our miracle. Sometimes all we need to do is just lift our voice. Oh, God, hear me. Sometimes we don't even need to come to the front and shout. All we need to do is come and say, Lord God, have mercy on me. I wonder, did they hear that he was a man? of mercy and compassion. Because this word mercy in this text is a Greek word that is el elio. And it means to have compassion or to be compassionate. You know what they were saying? Jesus, look at us. Look at our lives. Would you have compassion on us? And this was my own thought process because when you look at leprosy, it's horrendous. The disfigurement's horrendous. The scabbing, the crustacean of the skin, the, the, maybe even the eating away of it at times. And I wonder to myself, did they roll up their arms? Did they pull back the face covering? Did they open up their chest? I don't know. Did they say, Jesus, look at us. never forget a young girl coming to see me. She was cut from her finger. And I never realized at the time, I just seen her hands. She just rolled them all up like that. She said, can God have mercy on a person like me? Yes. He can. He saved her. 
He cleaned her. Oh, she's still covered in scars. But he had mercy. And I wonder to myself, is that what they done? Look, look at my condition. Do you know, folks, Jesus already knew about her condition. Jesus knows about yours, but there's something about honesty. There's something about coming before him. There, there's something about saying, Lord, look at, look at my life. Look at my circumstances. Please have mercy. It's, it's a cry from the heart. Touch my life, oh God. Touch me in my deepest point of need. Have mercy. And here's, here's Jesus says something absolutely incredible. He says, go show yourself to the priest. He didn't indicate that he was going to heal them there and then. And, and they understand the context of what Jesus said, that when you deemed yourself clean, or, or when you deemed that you thought that leprosy had left, or you had been healed from it, you went to the high priest, he examined you again, and then he deemed you fit to live back in community life. And Jesus says to them, You've still, why live still leprosy? He says to them, go and show yourself to the high priest. Now, this is where it switches. They needed to have the faith in what Jesus had said was going to happen to be true. Something of faith now is kicking in. Because they would have known the only time you can go to the high priest is when you are deemed clean or when you are free from leprosy to be deemed clean. They believed that what Jesus was saying was that as you begin to walk to him, I'm about to do something in faith and according to your faith. Why? Because the Bible says that as they walked, they became clean. In an act of obedience, everybody at times wants a miracle, but no one's willing to walk in the faith for the miracle. Oh, we want it. Yeah, and listen, I'm, I'm one of those ones where we're going to cry, absolutely. But there's sometimes God says, are you going to believe what I say? Are you going to begin to walk in the freedom? Are you going to begin to walk in the healing? Are you going to begin to walk in the power that is in my word, that is in my spirit? Hallelujah. Because in that walking, you will find yourself set free. Him who the Son sets free is free indeed. There's a walking in freedom. There's a standing up at times. And these lepers all had a choice. We can either begin to make our way to the high priest or we can begin to make our way back to the colony. But they chose the words of Jesus. We will go and do what he says. And sometimes that's where it all sits, folks. It's just being obedient to the word of God. And sometimes in that obedience, what you begin to find is freedom. What you begin to find is liberty. What you begin to find is God meeting you. I wonder myself with Connie, you know, nothing happened last Sunday night, the Sunday before that, or the Sunday before that. But I wonder, did Connie begin to walk out of this church with faith in her heart to believe, hold on, I have a God who can meet my needs regardless of where I am. Because it doesn't always have to happen here. Here, all I want to do is build your faith to believe, to begin to walk. You see, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. There's something about faith that takes place. And all I can see as these men, as they begin to walk, I, this is my imagination, this is my mind. I can see one of them look and feel, oh, my skin's different. My arms. I can see there's no mirrors. And I can see him turning to the other one. What, what's my face like? You're beautiful. I can see the Wow. It's incredible. And I can see, what, legs? You're healed. Hello. So are you. So are you. So, wow. Can you, folks, we can just picture all these 10 men beginning to look at each other. Oh, listen, I'm healed. I can see them jumping. I can see them dodge. I can see the Pentecostal two-step come out. I can see all sorts begin to happen. I can see them hug each other, embrace each other. I can see something incredible. 
Again, let me go back to my team challenge days for a moment. I'll never forget, Pastor Sam, you've been with me. When you see rows of, of drug addicts and alcoholics that have been set free in the Teen Challenge graduation. And when you see them all, these, these wonderful people who were once trapped in addiction. And there's rows of men and men and men. And then you go to the side, they separate them, by the way. And then over the side, of girls and there's rows of girls. And they say, here's what you see. And we'll all put their arms around each other. Look at the dance. I'm free. It's an incredible sight. I always encourage people to go and see it because it's something so beautiful, so wonderful, so magnificent. You just see them hug and embrace and shout. And then we all go out for a Chinese after. Hallelujah. It's incredible. There's always food in it somewhere. But it's incredible. We hug each other. We embrace each other. Hallelujah. Maybe tonight will be one of those nights where, where maybe not all drug addicts or alcoholics, we've maybe not even been in addiction, but listen, we have all experienced the power of God. Maybe we'll hug each other, put our arms around each other, and begin to move and celebrate and jump and say, Hallelujah! He has set me free! Let that be the shout. Let us rejoice over what Christ is on. Now, one last thing that is probably the most important of it all. One of the men is so thankful for what God has done in his life. He can't help but turn back. And as he turns back, he finds himself at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says that as he goes back with a loud voice, it's incredible, he, he now has a loud voice. And he glorifies God. And he falls on his face at his feet, giving thanks. You know what is beautiful in a Christian life? Is the man or the woman that is so thankful for what God has done for them. And Jesus acknowledges it. They're so thankful. I'm not mean to single anybody out tonight, but I remember sitting next door with John Bay. A lot of you see him coming in and out. And as Johnny and I began to sit and talk one day at the drop in, he began just to tell me of his thanks of what God has done in his life. He was so thankful. Tears would begin to fill his eyes as he would tell me of what Christ has done. And I could just see in a man, here is a man so thankful for what Jesus has taken him from and lifted it from and brought him to. And even still, when you hear him pray on a Sunday morning, he stands up and he always says, thank you, oh God, for what you've done. May we have that heart. You will have to be in the depths of despair. You will have to have been a drug addict. You will have to have been an alcoholic. You will have to have been a gambler. You can just be so thankful that regardless of what you are, you were once a sinner, but now you're a saint. You know, the Bible never addresses you as a sinner after you get saved. It calls you a saint. And we should be so thankful that he has made us to be partakers of his glorious kingdom. You see, Jesus recognizes that one came back. And this is most important. Jesus says, was there not ten? Where's the other nine? And really, there's no answer. We don't really get an insight and we try to look up and we try to wonder. But we recognize one is thankful. One is thankful. You know, he is the only one that Jesus made whole. Why is that important? Jesus provided a miracle for all of them, absolutely. But only nine of them received the healing for the body. Only one of them received the healing for their spirit and soul. In the human life and in the human heart, all of us want miracles. Out there, they want miracles. 
but sometimes that's all they want. And I'm not being a crit critic towards people. It's wonderful to have the body healed. And it's wonderful to give God the glory for healing a body. And God, even in His mercy, will heal the ungodly. He will touch the ungodly. He will be merciful to the ungodly. He will even in their sin still heal their bodies at times. He will do that because he's God. That does not mean they have got whole. W-H-O-L-E. Whole. And Jesus says to this man, because you have come back and your desire has been me capture this tonight. This man just didn't want healing of the body. He wanted Jesus. And you see when a man gets Jesus or a woman, they become whole. They are made whole. They are made the way God intended to be saved to be made whole. Men and women will finally go out in the eternity even if they've had their bodies healed in this life. But the most important thing is not that you go out with a body that is made healed or, or, or being healed, but that you go out with a life that has been made whole. You need to be saved. You need to know Jesus. You need to repent and come to him and fall at his feet and ask for mercy. And Jesus says, Arise, go, thy faith has made thee whole. I pray tonight that God might touch your body, particularly if you're already a Christian. We're going to, of course, we're going to pray. But I also pray tonight for you that maybe doesn't know Jesus, but still needs a miracle, but that you will receive the greatest miracle of all, and that is that you will become whole. That Jesus Christ will touch your life, and you will fall at his feet, and you will worship him. And you will fall in love with the Savior of the world. For tonight, he is glorious. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you. Hallelujah. Peter and the band, could you please come up as we begin to worship him in a moment. Spirit of the Lord. Let's close our eyes, church, for a moment. Oh, Holy Spirit. Touch hearts right now. Let signs and wonders even come. 